David was an amazing man of God. But what made him amazing was God. Uh, as I read from Genesis to Revelation, and I look at men and women who have known the Lord, old covenant, new covenant, makes you jealous, don't it? Makes me jealous. I say, Lord, if, if, they know, if they could know you like that, I can know you like that. If they could accomplish great feats, I can accomplish great feats. And it's all by faith. Hebrews 11, it's all by faith. It's all by faith. It's not by feelings. It's not by emotions. It's not by circumstances. It's not by natural education or good looks, pedigree, nationality. It's not accomplished by wealth. It's accomplished by faith in God. Faith in God. Jesus said, when I come back to the earth, will I, have, will I find that kind of faith, like that woman who kept on going to the unjust judge and just wouldn't stop. I want to have that kind of faith in this generation. I want to trust God. I want to know God. I want to believe God. I mean, there's so many ways we can compromise and we can take a pathway of least resistance. I, uh, walking by faith is the pathway of greatest resistance. But the bigger the battle, the greater the victory. I want to have that kind of faith. And so I, I look at those who are our examples, and David is an example for us. And God had said about David, he said, I'm looking for a man after my own heart. And we look at David, and he had a heart after God. And you can see that heart after God revealed in the Psalms he wrote, 78 Psalms. And when he became king, he established what we call the Tabernacle of David, where, where people would come and they would worship and sing to the Lord 24 hours a day and Lift up the name of the Lord. And we see it when he overcame Goliath and the Philistines and uh, the many knights and all of the enemies of God. See, David accomplished eight major things in his life. And he uh, wrote the book of Psalms, he, uh, basically 78 of them. And then he overcame Goliath and the enemies. He overcame the enemy. He, he raised up a mighty army. Saul had a ragtag army. That's what Saul had. Saul had a ragtag army. But when David came, D David, who became a mighty man because of his faith in God, he raised up a mighty army, a mighty army, a an unconquerable army. He, he ended up with 300 mighty men. Can you imagine this? 300 mighty men, men that were just like him in faith. They were brave and courageous and strong and fearless. And then he unified all of Israel. See, because Israel to a great extent was, was dysfunctional, you know, the 12 tribes. But David came and he brought all of the, he brought unity to the people of God. He brought organization to the government. He brought, uh, he actually brought success to the nation of Israel. Uh, really, there, there was no other nation like Israel and all the world after David got done, and then Solomon, his son, stepped in. But do you know it was David who came up with the plan? He wanted to build the temple. They call it the Temple of Solomon. But do you know who actually came up with all the plans? David did. David, the Lord, he cried to God. He knew God. He walked with God. He, he uh, experienced God in ways that are so amazing and God gave to him the blueprints, and he wanted to build the temple of God. And, and he went to Nathan, and he said to the prophet, can I build the temple? And, 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 and Nathan said, yes, you can build the temple. But as Nathan was in prayer one day, the Lord says, no, tell David he can't build the temple. His son Solomon's going to build the temple. And that's what opened the door for David to fall, because David, the people would not allow him to go out any longer to battle because they didn't want something to happen to him. And then he got the devastating news that and he had been storing up the gold and the silver and he had been gathering all the building materials and then he was told, you are not going to build the temple. And discouragement hit him and he got bored. <laughs> Boredom is the playground of the devil. We dare not be bored. Without a vision of people perish. But David unified the people of Israel. He established praise and worship in the house of God. He, he, uh, he, 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 he did a lot of wonderful things, amazing things. But Psalms 23, I think to me, is 
six verses of profound revelation because he talks about the Lord, Yahweh, and he talks about him 13 times in six verses. And then he talks about 16 major events. And then he talks about 17 times he refers to himself. And so we'll look there for just a little bit tonight. In Psalms 23, verse 1, he said, The Lord, Yahweh, the Yahweh is my shepherd. Now, he had a revelation of what it meant to be a shepherd because he had been one. And he knew he was one of God's sheep. And you, you have to see God as your shepherd. But you've got to see yourself as a sheep, as a lamb. And I did teaching on, on sheep one time, the personality, the traits, the characteristics of sheep. Sheep are really dumb. Sheep are really helpless, defenseless. They can't make it on their own. I remember uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I... I uh, I'd go out and stay with a family that had 16 kids, and they were farmers. And there was a guy that had, an old guy that had sheep, and he had, a, he had woods, but, and he had a fence around these woods. But these sheep were the most pitiful sheep you ever saw because the farmer didn't take care of these sheep. I never felt so bad in all my life for any animal than those dumb sheep because their wool, they, 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 it was all matted and ugly and gross and, and they were all filthy and dirty. See, you know, even dogs clean themselves. I mean, even, even cats clean themselves and they can even uh, defend for themselves and they can even eat for themselves. You know what I mean? They can look out sheep. sheep. Now we're talking, not talking about mountain sheep. We're talking about regular sheep. Them sheep were full of germs and disease. And if you would have picked up their wool, they were full of all kinds of worms because the wool would grow down around them and they were just so filthy. And I'm sure eventually when that old farmer died, they probably had to slaughter all those sheep because he just was not a good shepherd. Sheep cannot take care of themselves. In the book of Jeremiah, God talks about the shepherds, that they're nothing but a bunch of barking dogs. They don't care about the sheep. They don't want to feed the sheep. So the first job of a shepherd, believe it or not, is to provide good food and good water for the sheep. Very important to have. How many know food and water is important? Good, good food and water. But he said, the Lord, he knew Jehovah. He knew Yahweh. He knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew the God of Moses, the great I am. He says, he is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. And you've got to see God that way. You've got to see him as your shepherd. He, he's got to be your shepherd. He's got to be your all in all. See, to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a lamb, their whole life is, it, is completely dependent upon the kind of shepherd they have. Their whole life. So my whole life depends upon my shepherd. My, my, my mental condition, my emotional condition, my physical condition, my future, my... My everything is caught up in my shepherd, and his name is Jesus. The Lord is, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, I'm totally convinced if, if there was talking sheep, that if you ask a little lamb about their life, I'm totally convinced all they do is brag about their shepherd if they had a good shepherd. Oh, did you meet my shepherd? Do you know my shepherd? Do you know my Lord? Do you know, do you know the one who protects me and feeds me and provides for me and, and delivers me and helps me? And, and, and I remember the time that I got caught in thickets and he was right there. I remember the time that a wolf came to get me and he took his club and he hit him in the head. I remember the time when I fell over a cliff and he, he took a staff with, a, with, 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 with it, it, they called it, a, 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 I think, a crook and he pulled me back up out. The Lord is my shepherd, and because he is my shepherd, I know him as my shepherd, I shall not want. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. Now, of course, sheep got to give back to the shepherd what he, he, he requires. He wants their wool. Do, do you know we could talk about that tonight? Because every year, uh, farmers will shear their sheep. They shear their sheep. They take them right down to the hide. They take them right down to the hide. Why? Because all of that wool, which in the wintertime is fine, but in the summertime, it's detrimental. 
I mean, you'll, you'll get stuck in thickets. Uh, you, 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 you'll get filthy and dirty. It will make you sweat to where you will literally die because the body temperature goes up way too. You know, in the old days, they made all clothes out of wool. Have you ever wore a wool sweater? Wool pants, I hate them, man, they're itchy. <laughs> but made out of wool, but he's got to be sheared. So I'm telling you right now, the shepherd's got to shear you. He's got to, all that excess wool that just hangs on you, man, he wants to cut it off. You know, that's why I said in the book of Acts, it says, and they went and sold everything they didn't have need, and they just gave it to the apostles who did not keep it for themselves. Praise the Lord. They took care of the widows and the orphans and the needy and anybody else. And they used it to propagate the gospel. Well, God's constantly shearing me. I'm so glad. He's got to shear. You know what? He, we're like a tree and like the apple trees. They got to cut off the branches. They, they got to prune us. Say, Lord, prune me. He's got to cut things off of you. And how many know that is not fun? That is not enjoyable when you get pruned. <laughs> when God begins to cut away things in your life that you really, really are a hindrance to you really interfering, really getting between you and God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now listen, he, my Lord, maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know, I am, um, we call it ants in the pants. Any of you ever have ants in the pants? Just, you can't sit still. You got to get up. You got to move. You got to do this. You got to do that like Martha, busy, 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 just busy, busy, busy. No, he says, he maketh me. David said, my shepherd, this invisible shepherd, this invisible God, the great I am, he makes me lay down in green pastures, good feeding grounds. See, what the first thing a, a good shepherd does is he spies out the land as he's leading his sheep. He is looking for a field where there's, there's, no, there's no snakes and there's no poison and there's no weeds. It's good clover, good green grass. It's good eating. It's good eating. So God wants to lead his sheep into good eating. He wants you to grow, desire this and Seal murk of the word that you may grow thereby. He wants to feed you with good truth. He wants to feed you. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. He gives us the word. He gives us good feeding. He gives us good truth. You know. There's a lot of bad pastures right now. There's a lot of places. If I was not a pastor, if, I, if God did not put me over a local uh, uh, group of people or a place to minister the word, I really don't know where I would go. I'm just being honest with you. I, I really don't know where I would go because I'd want good food. But I want the whole, I call it shebang, whole kit and caboodle. I, I want... I want all of the truth. I, I don't want, Paul said, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. Now, yes, yes, I believe in divine healing, but I, I don't want to just hear about healing. Yes, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, but I just don't want to hear about that. Yes, I believe in holiness, but I just don't want to hear, I want all of it. I want, I want to eat the whole lamb, the Passover lamb. They were supposed to eat all of it and I know a lot of people believe today that, well, I'm called to preach prosperity. I'm called to preach deliverance. Or I'm called. Well, the early church didn't believe that. If you read the epistles, they preached the whole counsel of God. They, they gave, you know, it's like your physical body. It, it needs all kinds of vitamins, doesn't it? It needs, you know, I, I used to really, really like oranges. I was, man, I liked oranges. And I would eat oranges till they came out of my ear until one day, I became allergic to oranges because God didn't design me to do nothing but eat oranges. He made me to eat broccoli <laughs> and cauliflower and beans and steak 
and lobster. <laughs> he made me eat a, to eat a whole bunch of good stuff. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So some people just get caught on certain scriptures of the Bible. I want, I want, I want to eat it all. This is good as good green pasture. He makes me lie down in it. That's another thing. They lie down in the pasture. It's not like she crawl up to a table and the shepherd comes and puts a plate of green grass in front of them. No, it's living grass. It's not dead grass. Sheep don't eat hay like cattle. They eat living matter. The word's got to be alive in us. We've got to eat living. It's got to be quickened. It's got to be living word. It can't be dead word. It can't be dried up, brown, baled hay. It's got to be living. It's, so that's where the, the shepherd takes his sheep. He takes them into green pastures where they can eat good green grass and they can absorb and they can lay down in, in peace and tranquility. And this is where God wants to lead us. But a lot of sheep aren't being led by God. They're not being led by God. They're being led by their feelings and their emotions. And, hey, who, who, you know, Ed Sullivan used to come on. And he says, we have a really big show, black and white. As a kid, I remember black and white TV, Ed Sullivan, Sunday nights, because we weren't believers. And we had a really big show. And so we'd all sit down and watch how he was going to entertain us. And that's what a lot of the church is today. It's nothing but entertainment. We're going to entertain you. We're going to make you feel good. We're not going to give you what you really need to grow spiritually. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me. Notice, he doesn't drive us. He doesn't beat us. He doesn't make us. We're following him. And isn't that the very first thing that Jesus said? Follow me. Matter of fact, keep your finger here and just flip over to John 10, 10. Just John chapter 10, verse 1 for a moment. Because I do want to get through Psalms. 23 tonight. There's only six verses, but I'm telling you, man, it's, it's packed with power. So, uh, in John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Well, he is the door. We've got to come through Jesus. It's all got to be about Jesus. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of of the sheep. Now this is amazing because Jesus is the shepherd and yet he is the door. <laughs> he, he, is, he is the shepherd but he is a sheep. He is a lamb. He was the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. To him the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice. Oh, I want to hear the voice of Jesus. You know, when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I hear his voice. That's him talking to me. Who's my mother, my brother, my sister, but they that do the will of my Father in heaven? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? And he calleth his own sheep by name. He knows your name. He knows my name. He said he knows every hair on our head. Calls us by name. And what does he do? He leadeth them out. He leadeth them. He goes before them to protect them, to provide for them, to help them, to guide them, to lead them, to, to, to deliver them, to, to take care of them. He leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. See, Jesus has never done one thing. He has never asked us to do one thing that he himself has not done. He says, take up your cross and follow me because he took up his cross. He said, die that you might have life because he died that we might have life. He said, do whatever the Father says because he did whatever the Father says. Everything that Jesus requires his sheep to do is because he himself has already done it. What an example. Hebrews 1. God who at some died times and in diverse manners spake unto a the prophets by the, by the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. We see the father and the son, and the son says, now I'm going to show you how to do this. Like a natural father shows his children. 
He says, I'm going to show you how to make your bed. I'm going to show you how to uh, 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 work in the garden. I'm going to show you how to read and write. I'm going to show you how to obey authority. I'm going to show you. And Jesus has showed us the way. He has gone before us. Just the fire by night and the cloud by day, he has gone before us and he has made a way. I am so glad we are on the other side of Calvary. I, I really, I know we, we think it's very, very difficult the day we live in it, and it is. It is, it is, it is, and I am not making light of that. It is more difficult now to live for God now than when I was a kid. It is. Way more distractions, more way, way more deceptions. Way, and a lot of the doctrines we're hearing today, I did not even hear preachers say what they're saying 20, 30 years ago. The bizarre stuff they're saying today, I did not hear them say that 20, 30 years ago. And now it's, it's accepted and embraced as truth. And it's not truth. It's not what Jesus taught. But he goes before me. If God before me, who can be against me? It says, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. They follow him, period. No if, ands, or but. Where he leads, I will follow. Where is he going to lead me? He's going to lead me into green pastures. He's going to lead me into paths of righteousness. He's going to lead me into obedience. He's going to lead me into peace and joy. He's going to lead me into working in the harvest field. Where he leads, I will follow. I've got to follow. For they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. You know, I, I never recognized it, but I flee. I flee from a lot of preachers. I, 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 uh, some years ago, I, I had, we, we haven't had TV in the house. But I thought, well, I'm going to get a, one of these little dishes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fed. I'm, a, I'm so hungry spiritually, i got to get fed. And you can see the dish up over there on the, on, on, on the garage or on my son's side of the house. But what you don't realize is the cords were clipped. I, 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 I signed a contract even for the dish, and I installed it, and I put a TV in my bedroom, and I'm sitting in my bedroom, and I'm flipping for the word. And I come across this, this well-known preacher, which was not well-known to me because I had never seen him before, and he begins to preach on the subject of grace. And he's got a crowd that is so massive, it's amazing, and he's an Asian. And I'm listening to this guy, and I'm going, no, that's not true. That's bizarre. That can't be God. Oh, I was so upset. I had just installed the dish. And I'm watching this preacher. I jumped up, went over and grabbed a pair of wire cutters, and I clipped the wires. I said, I can't watch this. I had turned on some other preachers. And I'm telling you what I just said. It ain't worth it, man. This is garbage. This isn't taking me into holiness. This isn't leading me into sacrifice. This isn't leading me into death. This isn't leading me into holiness. This isn't leading me into obedience. This isn't leading me into his divine nature. I can't watch this. And it says, a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. Yeah, but pastor, I like that preacher. I don't know what to say. You must not be reading the same Bible I'm reading. You must not know the same Jesus I know because Paul said if we are an angel from heaven preach any other Jesus unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if, if I preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached you unto you the first, let me, be a, let me be damned. For they know not the voice of strangers. They go, man, I, I can't. I know somebody one time, my son Michael and I, they, a couple that had been coming to this church, they had gone to a, a big camp meeting. And they brought home this video, and they were so excited about this video. And Michael and I went home because I said, okay, let's get fed, let's get fed. We stuck the video in, and we began to watch this well-known preacher. We both at the same time basically said, oh, this is nuts. This is insane. And we pulled the tape out. Michael, did we bust the tape? I don't know what we did. Remember that? And we pulled it out. We said, we can't watch this. This is nuts. Well, my sheep hear my voice. Whew, what does that tell you? And a stranger they'll not follow. 
So we're back in Psalms 23. He says, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Now water, water is very, very important for sheep. Grass is important and water is important because, see, sheep are stupid, really. Sheep will drink from a mud puddle filled with bacteria. Sheep just got to drink. They got to drink. They got to they drink. And, and the only way that a lamb would get the right kind of water is if it follows the shepherd and drinks from the right kind of water. And a shepherd will take its sheep to a, a deep flowing river, deep river, where the water's fresh coming off of the mountains. Takes it to a cool, refreshing, living water. That's what Christ wants to take us. Remember, it tells us in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and cleansed it and washed it with the washing of the water of the word. It says them that, are, that we must be born of the water and the spirit. Uh, some people think that's water baptism. It's not. It's the water of the word. The word of God, the living word of God, and we're eating the word and we're drinking the word. Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Isn't that not what he said? He said, if you don't, you have no life in you. What type of life? Zoe life. He said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he offers us this, this, this place of, of a, a victory, of, of, of living life, of abundance. And we'll talk about that. But, but see, these sheep, these sheep, they're, they're very... The, the shepherd's making sure that all they do is get good green grass and wonderful, bacteria-free, refreshing, living water. Now, the health of those sheep, if they do not eat good green grass, if they eat, if they mix other weeds, you know, because in the Middle East, there's a lot of poisonous weeds. We, we had a, a cow by the name of Chewy. He was a good, he was a good, he was a good cow. And I liked Chewy and raised him since he was a little calf. And I, I, we had bought him at an auction, you know, and I bought him during the wintertime because that's when you can get him cheap. And I bottle fed Chewy, Chewy, and I bottle fed Chewy. And, and, and he would come and he was like more like a dog. And we had another cow by the name of Annabelle and she was almost like a pet. But Chewy, he, he got big, Chewy got big, you know, and, and, and Chewy was, you know, I don't know why I called him Chewy, but his name was, he was a brown, a brown steer and, and, one day I came over, and Chewy's face was all swollen up and pussed. And he was sick. He could hardly breathe. And I had to put him down. And I found out why. Because I didn't know it. He got into a cherry tree. And the leaves of a cherry tree will kill a cow. I didn't know that. I would have protected Chewy, but I wasn't a good shepherd. I didn't know that or locust leaves even, will kill a cow. I didn't know that. I thought they could eat any kind of leaf, but I was wrong. Sheep think they can eat anything, watch anything, read anything, and they'll be healthy, and they'll experience life and life in abundance. It's a lie. It's a lie. We have sickly sheep today, dysfunctional sheep, confused sheep. They don't know what's up. They don't know what's down. They... they they, they, they don't follow as a shepherd. They, 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 their life's a complete, total mess. You know why? They're drinking from the wrong water hole, and they're eating from the wrong field. And you can't convince them. And there's a fence. God puts an invisible fence up, but the grass is always greener on the other side. So they jump the fence, and they're going to get some, some good, lush food, and they find out it's nothing but poison. And many of them are dying. But he says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Listen to this. He restoreth my soul. Now listen, the process. You got to have good, clean water because you followed the voice of Jesus to it. You got to have good, green grass. You know, sometimes, I, I've read many, many books through the years, and I've got a list of books that I actually suggest people read other than the Bible. But if you really don't know what to read, Read this. This is good all the time. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it alive to you. This is real. This is true. 
This is, I, 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 I teethed on the word of God, you might say. He restored my soul. Now, actually, another translation says it does not just refer to your mind or your will and your emotions, even though your mind has, has an effect on all of you. It refers to the whole man, spirit, soul, mind, and body. He says he is going to restore, he's going to revive, he's going to renew, he's going to regenerate, he is going to resurrect your soul. Whew, isn't that wonderful? But you got to drink from the right water hole and you got to eat from the right pasture. You got to be eating the right kind of food. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He'll quicken our souls. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. He restores my soul because you have issues. We have problems. We have afflictions. We have hurts. We have pains. We have sorrows. We have confusion. We have, we're a mess without Jesus. So Jesus comes. He says, I want to restore your soul. I want to save your soul. Isn't that amazing throughout the New Testament? He talks about he came to save our soul. With meekness, receive. Receive the engrafted word with meekness for the saving of your soul. He wants to save our souls. Restore our souls, our minds, our hearts, our lives. He leadeth me. Now listen, once your mind is being renewed, it's being regenerated, it's being transformed, it's being changed, it's being quickened, he will lead you in paths of righteousness, right living, the straight and narrow way, for his name's sake. You can't walk the straight and narrow path if you don't renew your mind. You can't live right if you don't think right. If you're not eating right, if you're not drinking right. It's just, you know, it's just, um, my family talks about it, and my daughter just came back from creation, and she was telling me, Dad, I, I know why people are so sick. They're so sick. They're eating wrong. She said, I saw families doing nothing but drink sodas. Sodas are terrible for you. I'm not on a health kick do uh, doctrine, but... Man, I tell you what, there, there, there's a lot of food out there that will literally kill you. And you can buy it, and it will kill you. I, I know we had a young lady who lived with us, and we mentored her, and we discipled her. Or her name was Ruth, and Ruth went off to Rainbow Bible Training Center. And when she was in our house, we didn't have soda in our house. We had water, and we had milk maybe and other things, but we didn't have soda. I just... My kids weren't raised with it because uh, I didn't want them to have the teeth problems that I had, but we weren't really raised with it. But anyways, she went off to Raymond. Next thing we know, she's in the hospital, and she's about dying, and I think it was her kidneys or something that almost stopped functioning, and it turned out she had been drinking Mountain Dew like it was water. Drinking. Drinking cans and cans and cans of Mountain Dew, and it was shutting down her kidneys. See, it wasn't living water, it was death. She did it innocently. She did it ignorantly. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, but people are drinking and eating from the wrong places, and it's killing them. It's killing their families. It's killing their children. It's killing their mind. It's killing their emotions. It's killing their commitment. It's killing their passion. It's killing their hunger. It's killing their, their longing for God. It's killing them, and they don't even know it. It's killing them, and you can't convince them to stop. And the shepherd of the sheep, Jesus, is saying, don't eat that. Don't drink that. Don't watch that. Don't do that. But they think they're smarter than God. God loves me. It won't hurt. Wouldn't that be stupid? Here you are, you're about to eat something, and I know it's full of poison. I say, don't, don't eat that. That's full of poison. And you go, listen, God loves me no matter what I do. <laughs> so you're going to, how about Tim, not the Lord thy God? Why, why eat that if you know it's going to kill you? I, I told you a story many times. My, my sister, Debbie, she, my whole family were smoke, cigarette smokers, big time. Tobacco, big time, big time. We'd all sit around our table. And I mean, I'm talking about I was probably 12 years old when I started smoking cigarettes. 
my brother smoked and my sister smoked and my mom smoked and my dad smoked and we'd sit around the table and we'd smoke Winston's. I switched to Raleigh and they thought it was the end of the world. But we all smoked Winston's. And we, it wasn't the Shekinah glory. And I got gloriously born again. And instantly God set me free from three and a half packs of cigarettes a day and from Swiss or sweets and from cigars and chewing tobacco set me free. He did. He set me free. And I led my sister to the Lord and I led my, Dennis, my brother Dennis and Dan and my mom and my brother Billy to the Lord. God allowed me to lead them all to Christ. My brother Billy called me up a couple of weeks ago and said, Mike, you don't know this, but you had an, an amazing impact upon my life. I never told you, but you, you, you had an amazing impact upon my life, and it's because of you that, that I came to know God, and, and I just want to thank you. But that was because God had done such a wonderful work in me. But now my brother Billy got free from smoking cigarettes, but my sister Debbie, <clears throat> my mom got free. Don't know about my dad. Debbie came to me one day and said, Mike, pray for me that I won't get cancer. And I said, I can't, Debbie, I can't. I said, you got, you got to believe God to get free from smoking. you got to get free. And she just refused to. And it was almost 20-some years later that we went to her deathbed, and she was full of cancer. Give no place to the devil. we we got to, you got, we got to stop eating at the... At the, at, in the wrong pastures, and I'm talking to Mike Yeager too, and we got to stop drinking the wrong waters. we got to drink living water. We, we, we gotta, we, his word's got to become sweet, and it's got to become our meditation day and night. It's got to become our all in all. So, he storeth my soul, leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He cannot take you into a path of righteousness if your soul is not being restored. And he ain't going to drive you. He ain't going to make you. He isn't going to force you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, a lot of people like to use this, say, Oh, Pastor Mike, I'm in a, I'm in a valley of despair. I'm in a valley of death. Well, look, hold on here now. How did you get there? How did you get into that place of death? And, and really, a lot of people are not in the valley of the shadow of death. They are in the valley of death. You know what? You didn't follow Jesus there. See, these sheep follow Jesus into, because that's where the road leads. Jesus is leading them through a valley of the shadow of death. It looks like you're going to die, but you're not. But a lot of people, they're in a valley of death. Uh, there's a place I think out, in, in out west somewhere called the Valley of Death. You know why? There's no water out there. There's nothing out there. It's just nothing but death. But how do people get into the Valley of Death? They're eating wrong and they're drinking wrong. They're eating wrong and they're drinking wrong. And we get into a Valley of Death like my sister did with cancer. There, God didn't lead you into that place of temptation and tests and trials. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That's right, for 40 days, but he came out of it. He didn't die in it. You, you know, God will lead you into difficult places. He has. I've gotten into difficult places. God didn't lead me there. Financial problems, God didn't lead me there. Marital problems, God didn't lead me there. You know, I mean, physical problems, God didn't lead me there. I went there. I didn't follow my shepherd. I went astray. We all like sheep have gone astray. But then in the midst of that, I cried out to my shepherd, Oh, Jesus, rescue me. And he came and he rescued me with his crook and with his rod, his staff, and he rescued me. But he's going to lead you into test temptations and trials. But it's just... A shadow. You feel like you're going to die. You're not going to die. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It looks like you're a goner like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He literally led them into the burning furnace. How? Because he said, do not bow your knees to that golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. He said to Daniel, don't you stop praying three times a day. And he ended up in the lion's den. And it was the valley of the shadow of death, but it was not death. I cannot tell you how many times it looked like God was leading me to my death. And I was facing the communists who were waiting for me on the Isle of Leong, and they were there with their machetes and with their guns, and they were going to kill me, and I jumped off the front of the canoe, and they split like the Red Sea. When the Yupik Indians tried to burn me to death in the Mackay, and they couldn't hurt me. 
in many situations. When I was being led of God, it looked like it was over with man. It looked like I was gone, but I was being led of God. It was not a circumstance I got myself into out of disobedience. Hello? So what do we do if we're in the valley of death? Repent. Say, Lord, have mercy on me. Deliver my soul from this valley of death because I haven't followed you. I haven't obeyed you. You didn't lead me here. You know how God is getting such a bad rap today? People are blaming God, and they got themselves in the mess. People misusing their finances, misusing their time, treating people wrong, watching the wrong stuff, doing the wrong things, having the wrong attitudes, and then God gets the blame. It ain't God. It ain't God. He just didn't listen to Jesus. Now listen, yea, though I walk, yea, though I walk, I walk, say I walk, I don't camp, I don't live, I don't stay there. I walk through the valley of shadow of death because Jesus is still walking on. I will fear no evil. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Oh, when I'm drinking from the right well and I'm eating from the right pasture, I will have a sound mind, a sound mind, a stable mind. I will. No matter what's happening, though a thousand fought my left and ten thousand at my right, it will not come nigh me. Keep your hand here and flip over to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, please. Just we're about getting ready to close here. I I, I, I just. It's amazing things what Isaiah saw by the Spirit of God. And look here in Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created the old Jacob, and he that formed the old Israel, Fear not, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, and thou art mine. Well, pastor, I really don't know if God knows me by my name. Get out of here. He sure does. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. What do you do when someone knocks on the door? You can do one of two things. You can either ignore and, or open. You know how I many people are ignoring the shepherd? The shepherd, he's standing outside, and he's knocking on the door. He's saying, let me in. I want to lead you. I want to guide you. I want to provide for you. I want to protect you. I want to help you. I want to deliver you. I want to set you free from every stick and lie of this world, the flesh and the devil. Yes, this world is like the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm going to get you to the other side if you'll just follow me. Just follow me. That's what he said to Peter and John and James and all the disciples. Follow me. And how many times did he say to people, follow me, and they would not? The rich young ruler, go sell all that you got. Come and follow me. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Ha ha, ha ha, isn't that wonderful? You got a personal Savior. You got a shepherd who cares. He cares. He loves you. Well, if God really loves me, why does he help me? You won't listen. You won't listen. How can you help? Have you ever tried to help someone and they just won't listen? I have tried to help people through the years and they won't listen. They won't listen to the word. They won't listen to truth and they lost their marriage and they lost their health and they lost their lives and a lot of them lost their souls. They would not listen. Say, Lord, help me listen. The day will come when you wish to God you listened. I know the day comes many times when I wish to God I would have listened. I will fear no evil, for thou, what? Thou art with me. God, you're with me. God, let me see that. You're with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod, in another translation, says a club. A club, for not for you, but for the enemy. That when the lion comes and the bear comes, 
when a snake comes, when a varmint comes, when a coyote comes, when, when, when a mountain lion comes. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. They're there for me. Listen, verse 5. We kind of switch over here now because now we're going to go from, from to a banqueting room. God, God is going to prepare a meal. You know, God has prepared a meal for us in the, in the presence of all the demonic world. They can't, the, the, uh, 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 divine healing and, and joy and peace and deliverance. And in all of our needs, it's a meal. It's a wonderful banquet set for us. Thou preparest the table. He did it, didn't he? He did it when he was on the cross. He said, it is finished. He overcame principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. He said, behold, all authority and power has been given to me. He prepared a meal. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in them that love him. Not worthy whatever you're going through. It's not worth even talking about compared to eternity. If we never get another answered prayer, so what? If we never see God show up again, so what? It's okay, but he will show up. He will show up, but even if he didn't, so what? He rescued my ham out of the fire, my bacon. <laughs> he pulled me out of the flames. Thou prepares the table before me, for me, in the presence of mine enemies. Oh, I bet he gets the devil's goat. This place is still here. He probably can hardly stand it. Every time he sees Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He just, it must aggravate all the demons. It's got to aggravate them. There's people who hate the name of Jesus. Can you imagine the devils in them, how it screams? Wants to get rid of this place, wants to shut it down, wants to shut our mouths, and we just get louder. We're just going to reach out more. We're, we're reaching out more all the time by Internet. Every week we're putting up how many videos, Brother Mark? How many? Three, four, five? At one time, we were putting up three videos every day, putting up new teachings, not, not new for Dango, but the word, just putting it out there, putting it out there. Yeah, but Pastor Mike, we've only had 40 people watch that one video. Praise the Lord. Oh, we've only had three people see this video. Praise the Lord. We don't know. We're scattering our seed like the sower that soweth the word. We're just putting it out there, and it's like bread upon the water. It'll come back after many days. Just got to do it by faith. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I might end up preaching here every night when we don't have somebody. We'll see. <laughs> Let's see what God does to this little man. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. That, that is a perfumed oil. It is an olive oil, but it's perfumed like, like when the woman, when, when Mary poured it over Jesus to prepare him for burial. Uh, oil, we could talk about that. Oil was very important for the sheep because actually oil would even cause the, the parasites to come out of their, their, their skin because parasites would try to dig their way. And when they dumped the oil on them, it would drown the parasites. They couldn't breathe. It's like if you take if you take a wood tick that digs into your flesh and you and you cover it and you touch its rump with a with a, the, the end of a hot match after you blow it out, it'll back right out. But you can put things over and it cause the parasites to come out because they need that oxygen that they're getting from the outside. But he says, You anoint my head with oil. Listen, my cup runneth over. Say my cup runneth over. You know, in Ephesians 3, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God's at work in me. Is God at work in you? Is Jesus at work in you? Will you cooperate with him? Will you agree with him? Will you say yes, Lord, yes? If nobody else says yes, will you say yes? Will you say, Lord, here I am, send me. I'm yours, Lord. I, ain't got no, I don't have nowhere else to go. I have no other reason for living. Honestly, I'm telling you right now, I love my wife and I love my children. I love you guys, but I have no other reason for living but Jesus Christ. You can take this world's wealth and its fame and all of its junk. I don't care about it. I really don't. 
I only want Jesus. And if I can't have Jesus, just take me out now, Lord. Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> I just want Jesus. There is no other reason. What if you end up homeless? What if you end up in the poorhouse? Been there many times. There's times my wife and I didn't have nowhere to lay our head because we were working for God, but that was okay. Surely goodness, say surely. Surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy. God has three angels. Surely goodness and mercy. <laughs> surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days. Yeah, goodness and mercy will follow me. No, because you're following Christ. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You're following Jesus. So surely, absolutely, goodness and thank God for mercy shall follow me all the days of my natural life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a long time, people. Because I followed him. I'll dwell. If, I, if I follow the Lord, if I go on to know the Lord, I will dwell in his house forever. Did you know the conditions that David laid down? That, that believe it or not, Psalms 23 was full of conditions. It's all conditional. Well, God's love isn't conditional. Well, no, God is love. That, that, that is not conditional. God is love. But for you to walk in that place of fullness of joy, in his presence there's fullness of joy and life forevermore, it's conditional. You've got to follow the shepherd. I, I tell people, I said, do you have to follow Jesus to go to heaven? You can't believe people are so whacked in the theology. They think they can go to heaven without following Jesus. You got to follow Jesus. Now, the best way for me to help people is for me to follow him. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, Still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no I won't turn back. I hope, you're, I hope you don't turn back. I hope you don't draw back under perdition.